Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar on CompTIA's A Plus Exam 220-802 covering objectives 2.2 and 2.3. I'm Brian Farrell and I am your moderator this evening and I am the well I am an, an instructor for Edmonds Community College for the PACE PACET program. Specifically, I teach the technology and integration support class, which covers the A plus, or covers CompTIA's A plus exam and CompTIA's network plus exam. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and get started on, to, on tonight's webinar. So first off, we'll be talking about what objectives we're going to be covering. And those, like I said earlier, are 2.2 and 2.3 of the 802, 802 exam. And those specific objectives cover common security threats and then securing the workstation. And with that, let's go ahead and begin getting into the material. So we're going to start with a, kind of a statement. Most attacks nowadays actually occur through several different means. So they, they're not always neatly confined into a single security category. A lot of attacks combine different categories to increase their effectiveness and some of the best deterrence or best mitigation techniques is to um, is user training and some common sense. So let's start with uh, directed security threats. And what are those? Well, let's talk about them. The first one that is directed is called shoulder surfing. If you haven't ever had it done to you, I'm sure you've done it to somebody else. That's looking over somebody's shoulder in an effort to gain sensitive access to sensitive information sometimes. Sometimes it's just because you're curious, sometimes just because they're curious. You don't even have to be present for shoulder surfing to occur. You can just leave a workstation or laptop up and running and anybody who comes by can take a look at it. The next type of directed security threat that you need to be aware of is social engineering. And that's actually probably the biggest security threat you're going to face. <laughs> now social engineering is using social pressure in an attempt to get the user to divulge sensitive information or to give away passwords. Uh, perhaps you've heard of Edward Snowden. I'm pretty sure you have. He used social engineering to get the NSA's secrets, which I'm pretty sure they're kind of sorry about as he's divulging all of those secrets to the world at large. Now, social engineering can occur in a multiple multitude of ways. Over the phone, you know, you get that phone call from somebody who's supposed to be tech support, and they ask you to uh, give give them your username and password so they can check something out. Mm, don't do it. Uh, social engineering can occur over email in person, via fake memos, or through a combination of methods. One of the big ones that's out there right now in, as far as social engineering is you'll get a phone call from somebody purporting to be from Microsoft. And they'll start the conversation by telling you that one of your PCs has got a virus and is spreading the virus on the internet. Actually, it's not nearly that coherent. But that's the gist of the conversation. What they're really trying to do is to get you to give them not only access to your PC, 
but also to give them your personal information as in credit card number, bank numbers, and so on and so forth. Now, I personally have taken two of these phone calls, and my wife has taken a couple of them as well. Uh, they don't tend to work on us, but I'm sure they work on somebody or else they wouldn't do it. Now, let's talk about phishing. Now, phishing is a type of social engineering. It's attempting to get the end user to divulge sensitive information, as always. I masquerading as a trusted entity. Entity. I'm pretty sure all of you have received a phishing email about some banker in England or in Nigeria who has a bank account and they'd love to transfer you some money. That is a phishing attempt. Now, phishing tends to be um, they spread the net wide in the hopes of gathering in a few. Or there can be spear phishing, which is when the, you are specifically targeted to be a victim. Closely related to phishing, we have farming. Uh, farming specifically uses a web page or site to glean sensitive information. And what they try to do is they try to trick you into clicking onto their site. And it may look like uh, Bank of America or Wells Fargo or even PayPal or something like that. It, it can look really similar. And what they're looking for you to do is to provide your credentials so that they can steal them. A lot of the times, farming sites are actually, be, you're actually being redirected to farming sites from legitimate sites. Uh, the legitimate site has been hacked and they've dropped a link to the farming site on the legitimate site. Sometimes Google catches that. Sometimes Google doesn't. You just need to be aware that it's there. And never give out your, your personal information unless you are 100% certain that it's legitimate. So now let's move on to opportunity security threats. Sorry about that. I had to clear my throat there for a moment. So what are opportunity security threats? Well, that's where you're not specifically targeted, but you're hit anyways. And we get to start by talking about malware. Now, malware is malicious software uh, used with the intent of ca causing harm. But it can also describe legitimate code that is poorly written. If you've ever used a program that a friend has written and it's been buggy, that can actually be called malware. Now, malware is a broad category and it contains all code-based security threats. And, as an added bonus, it's often hidden in legitimate code. So what's the first kind of malware we're going to talk about? We're going to talk about root kits. Now, this is still, still software that takes over the root account of a PC or a Mac or whatever. I'm going to call them all PCs because they're all personal computers. So this is stealth software that takes, takes over the administrative account. One moment, please. Sorry about that. Um, so rootkits take over the administrative account in an effort to gain control of your PC without you knowing it. <clears throat> now they attempt to hide their presence from the end user and through antivirus, through their ability or through their control of the administrative level of the PC. 
they can be pretty difficult to get rid of because they have access to your root account and they get to control what happens on that machine and what doesn't. In the worst case scenario, you may have to uh, reinstall your operating system. I hate it when that happens. I've only had to do that once. The rest of the time, I've been able to boot to a repair disk and remove them that way. But that's not always successful. Moving on, now we go to spyware. Spyware is software that installs itself with the intent of collecting users' keystrokes, well, usually. Um, actually, that would be a keylogger, which is a form of spyware. But spyware wants to collect data. They want to collect user information and user habits without your consent. Uh, spyware is often configured to just collect the information and periodically transmit it to a remote site. Spyware can often be difficult to find, especially if it's passive and it's not transmitting, where the person who installed it actually slings by your machine and, and downloads the information. Those can be awfully hard to find, so you need to take, take care. Now let's talk about viruses. Spyware, a virus is a malware that is attached to a host file, and it has two jobs. First job is, is to spread to other systems. The second job is, is to execute its payload. Now, a virus does require a host file to run. When the host file is run, then the virus's executable is also run. Viruses technically only affect drives, as in hard drives, USB flash drives. Um, it does not infect systems, it affects drives. Now there are bunches and bunches of different types of viruses. Uh, first one is, is the program or application. This is a pretty simple one. It's attached to a program or application. When the host file is opened, the virus runs. There are boot sector viruses. It attaches itself to the boot sector of the PC. That's kind of like the root kit. When the PC is booted and the boot sector gets access to so the boot sector bootloader is run, guess what? The virus is loaded at the same time. There's the polymorphic. Now this is a virus that attempts to hide its presence by changing its signature periodically. Uh, it's hoping to defeat signature-based antivirus, which happens to be the most common type of antivirus. Change the signature and the antivirus program no longer knows that it's a virus. Uh, then we have stealth, which uses a variety of methods to hide its present. And now here's a word that I really enjoy saying, not really, but the multipartite. And I think I said that correctly. Now these combine several different virus. Now these combine several different components of different types of viruses into one package. None of the components are effective on their own, but when combined, oh, watch out. They are nasty. Now let's move on to worms. Now that's malware that does not need a host file. They are very similar to viruses, but also very different. Worms exploit weaknesses in networks. They exploit network resources and services to propagate themselves and to move through networks. Worms are self-replicating. They do not need user interaction. One of the big problems with worms is they consume network resources, which often result in havoc on the network. Oftentimes, you won't even know that there's a problem until the network starts to slow down due to the worms 
actions and activities. And actually, I think worms nowadays aren't as big as a big of a threat as they have been in the past. But man, in the past, they were actually worse than viruses, at least if you ask me. Then there are the Trojans. Uh, this is malware that hides its purpose by disguising itself as something the end user desires. Download that free game. Yeah, you might want to be careful. It might have a virus or a worm attached to it. Uh, you know, they're used by not nice people to get users to download virus packages. This is one of the ways that um, botnets are created. They get people to download the Trojan, and it installs a rootkit, which then makes that PC join a botnet, and now you're a zombie node, and you won't even know it, not unless you're keeping careful track of your computer all the time. Now, these are the basic common security threats that CompTIA would like you to be aware of in Objective 2.2 of the 220-802 exam. And now we move on to Objective 2.3. And that's securing the workstation. And the first thing that we're going to talk about are password policies. So what's the first password policy that you should have? Your first password policy should be that passwords are required on all workstations in order to access the operating system. Passwords should be required on every system all the time. Why? Because not only do they authenticate the user, but they also create accountability. Somebody tells you that they didn't do something, well, guess what? You can check the logs to see if, in fact, it was them or not. They also help to prevent unauthorized access. Your next policy should be the setting of strong passwords. Now, something to keep in mind is if you even in a weak system, and all you require are letters. You can use uppercase, you can use lowercase, it does not matter to you. I would still recommend setting a minimum character length. And why is that? Well, if you just require letters, uppercase and lowercase, that gives you the power of 26. So if you want, if you say minimum password length is six characters, that's six to the 26th power. That's a lot of combinations. If it's eight, it's eight to the 26th power. That's even a tremendously more amount of combinations. Now, if you want to get really more difficult, you need to require a mix of characters, uh, including letters, numbers, and symbols. <clears throat> and this can give you up to the 84th power. So if you required six digits in length, but you required a mix of uppercase, lowercase, letters, numbers, and symbols, that would be six to the 84th power of numbers of combinations that could be re could be created with six digits. The other part of your password policy of setting strong password policies is restrict the use of names, uh, their own name, their wife's name, their kid's names, their dog's name, their goldfish name. If it's a name, it can be easily cracked. Uh, you also need to limit their ability to use easily guessed words. I hate to say this, but some of the most frequently used passwords is password. Crackers and hackers know that. Don't allow stuff like that onto your system. 
other policies that should be considered? Well, let's talk about aging of passwords. You should put a lifespan on passwords. Uh, passwords that don't expire become ineffective and they often become well known. The other thing is repeating of passwords. Don't allow your users to repeat passwords. Uh, the more th the more often they repeat a password, the more likely it's going to be that it's going to be an ineffective password. Uh, you should set a minimum, and you know I'd probably set it around five, five or eight uh, unique passwords before a password can be reused. There are ways to get around that. Your people will figure it out, but at least you're going to make them work to be able to do it. Another thing that you can do is you can as part of this password aging and repeating of passwords is you can set, at least in some systems, a time limit. So a minimum age of a password before it can be changed outside of administrative control. So now let's talk about user account management. And where do we start? We start by talking about restricting permissions. Um, use the principle of least privilege. And you're saying, so what is the what is the principle of least privilege? Well, that's setting account privileges to the least amount possible for the user to still get their job done. Do not give them full control over the system. Give them just just what they need to get the job done. You're going to irritate them with that. They're going to try and talk you out of it. Don't give into it. Stick with it. And then along that lines, even you as the administrator should be restricted to only the necessary level that you need. As a matter of fact, in your day-to-day -day work, you should have your own least privileged day-to-day uh, -day account. Another thing to do is to put all users into groups. Don't manage individual users, manage groups. Why is that? Because they're easier to manage. It's easier to manage a whole group of people as one than it is to manage each user one at a time. It's easier to be consistent. It's better to be consistent, and consistency will save your bacon. Uh, some of the groups that you should have, you should have administrative, administrator groups, power user groups, the standard user groups, and guest user groups. All of those groups should be created. All of them should have different privileges. And they should all be the minimum amount of privileges that are required. There are subgroups within those groups. You get to fine tune it, have fun doing it, and good luck. Uh, talking about uh, guest user groups, guest accounts should only be activated on a temporary basis. Guest accounts should only ever be turned on as they're needed. Why is that? Well, because guest user accounts tend to be a weakness in the system. And a lot of people leave guest user accounts up and active. And like I said, they're a weakness. They usually have fairly easily guest passwords, yada, yada, yada. So only turn them on as they are needed. Other than that, disable guest user accounts. Now let's move on to some other workstation security measures. Excuse me while things kind of catch up here or not. There we go. Uh, the first thing that you should do is you should always change default usernames. Why is that? Well, they're defaults. People know they're the defaults. Usually, if there's a default username, there's a default password. They're easy to exploit. 
So if it comes with a default username and password, change it. Change it as soon as you can. And disable that account if you can't change it. Do not leave the defaults in place. They are a major gaping hole in your security. And your whole goal is to be as secure as possible. <clears throat> in, inside of the enterprise environment, 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 there we go. I can speak on occasion uh, where you have multiple systems that you're administer, administering with multiple users, you need to make screensavers required. And these need to be the screensavers that need a password to get out of. Your whole goal here is to make it more difficult for your opponent, for the person trying to get into your system. Uh, one of the ways that was actually pretty common and is still fairly common of attacking systems is to, to find an unattended workstation that's logged in. So you should re should require, should enforce uh, password locked screensavers so that if a workstation is unattended or if it is, is inactive for a set amount of time, personally I'd set it to about two minutes, that it goes to the password locked screensaver. And the last thing that you can do to help secure the workstation Disable auto run, and and why is that? Well, somebody plugs in a flash drive. If auto run is enabled, it engages the flash drive. If that flash drive was infected, rather uh, maliciously or inadvertently, your workstation has now downloaded or installed that virus. If you disable auto run, you plug in the USB flash drive, guess what? The system says, okay, you've plugged in something, now what do you want me to do? Make the user consciously make the decision to run or not run um, software. Don't allow your systems to do it on their own. Thankfully, Microsoft has finally started making it so that by default, auto run is turned off for years and years and years and years. That was not the case, and it was a problem forever. And if you want to really secure your workstations, go into BIOS and disable uh, USB. And that that's something that you can do. It really irritates your users uh, since they can no longer update their, their iPods and iPads. Uh, but it can really save you in the long run if you disable USBs. And that about covers it for the information that needs to be covered in the 220-802 exam, Objective 2.3. On behalf of PACET and Edmonds Community College, I really appreciate the opportunities that this course gives, and I wish you all a good night.